hospitality last night, so thank you. Um, firstly, I'd just like to pay tribute to Stella and Mike and the people who have, they said, who aren't here, and people like Humphrey Sitters, who have put in so much time for this atlas. I was involved in the Somerset atlas, it was our first one, so we learned actually quite a lot from you guys in Devon, and we didn't do things like abundance, but next time we will. But I know how much work it takes, but it is absolutely <coughs> astonishing how much work it takes. Even once you've got the data in, and I thought, you know, Stella's look at the validation is so interesting, because you've got to get it right, and with today's point, I mean, it's very valid, but there are certain things about the atlas, things like observer bias, yet we do know, and I think it's going to be more like 10 or 12 years' time when you have to read it, I'm afraid. Uh, so you might be involved. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, it will be an incredibly valuable thing. What, we, what I'm here to talk about today really is what we can do with what we've learned. Now, I'd like to just say a few things um, about my connection with Devon. I, I'm from <coughs> across the border in Somerset. I'm actually from London. But my grandmother was born in what is now Drake's Wine Bar, <laughs> but was the London South Western Pub in Topsham, not Topsham, Topsham. <laughs> my, my mother and my late mother was evacuated down to the country house pub, it's all pubs. My great aunt owned the Windsor Castle in Exeter. Sadly, they've all gone. All the pubs have gone, that's it. I'd like to inherit it pub, but you know, you know. And I, I was very privileged to make the first spring watch, not far up the road from here, in Hathaway. And I care a lot about the birds of the West Country and about Devon and Somerset, and I know you do too. And I think, I suppose what strikes me, looking at Stella and Mike's presentation and knowing what we've learned recently about the declines and falls and rises of many of our birds, is how when I started birding as a kid in the 60s, um, I'm older than I look, uh, really roughly 50 years ago, and I... We learned about things, I suppose when I was in my teens, I learned about things like the Rhine and the Redback Shrike uh, declining, and I learned that a few species, I saw the first Chetty's Walks in Kent, and you know, now, now they're common. <coughs> so I, I was aware that some birds changed their range, but I don't think any of us, if you'd asked us in the 60s or 70s, would have had a clue that the changes would occur, both positive and negative, quite so rapidly quite so suddenly. It's a story I heard a few years ago that the birds in Ireland were doing their annual bird report. And like many bird reports, they would leave out the common birds. As you, you know, I think this was a view in the past, wasn't it? We're only interested in rare birds, and newcomers, declines and falls, rises. And so someone said, oh, you know what, we better look at corn buntings this year. We better actually get some records. I haven't seen corn bunting for a while. Turned out, corn bunting had actually gone extinct in Ireland, and no one knew. And as the lady here said about what can we do with this data, this is why it's so crucial. Because if you don't have the data, as they didn't in Ireland, they were losing things before they even realised. And that is a terrible thing. That happens. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the good news. Because as well as trying to stop declines of birds with data from an atlas like this, we also need to find ways of encouraging birds. Now, I might mention the little egret, of course, very famous case here. Little egrets and other water birds have colonised southern Britain. It is probably to do with two things. It's probably to do with climate change driving them a little bit more. <coughs> but it's also, a second factor is the factor that in Europe generally, wetlands which were declining hugely have been restored, particularly in the Netherlands, particularly in parts of Western France. And that produced a surplus of little egrets and they moved in. Now I remember age 10 in 1970 going to Brownsea Island with my mum, opening the hide window and seeing this purcell white creature. I didn't see another one in Britain for 19 years. Because they were really rare. And now you know, you do, I mean, when my kids, I drive my kids around, and they, you know, I say, there's an egret. They say, which, which kind? Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, trained, I've trained my, my now 11-year-old, Charlie. He, he, when you go off the starlings, you know, you're standing there, all starlings are milling around, you've got thousands of hundreds of people. 
And I got, got into the thing where every time the big one flew up, he would shout, Great White! <laughs> and watch the panic. <laughs> <laughs> As they thought, have these new creatures ever been otters? Have we got sharks? <laughs> um, water birds are doing really well. I noticed that nine out of eleven of your newcomers, and I appreciate that the newcomers include they include Ruddy Duck, which clearly was a newcomer, and they're not. Um, but nine out of eleven of your newcomers are water birds, and water birds are a great success story because, as, as Barbara Young, who's from the RFPB once said, if you want to bring water birds back, you just add water. <laughs> and it's a very valid point because the third point that I left out about little eagles were that had they arrived here and not had the sort of habitat, the safe places where they could breed and feed, they wouldn't have colonised. They certainly wouldn't have colonised in the numbers that they have. And that's a very important point that I'll come on to later on. Um, it's clearly not so easy to restore farmland and woodland. They're more complex habitats, and it takes a lot of that. And someone once said, if you're trying to restore an ancient woodland, the first 500 years are the hardest. <laughs> and there is a valid point there. I mean, you can, of course, make a difference, and people do. And in Somerset, where I live, quite a few people have private woodlands that they manage now for wildlife, <coughs> with the help of the Wildlife Trust, and that is helping. But we're fighting, as, as Mike and Stella said, we are fighting a way of using our countryside, which is really simply doesn't take into account the wildlife. I have watched over the last few years, as you have, many of these birds declining. And what worries me, you know, you have your 40%, Yellowhammer I think went from 80% to 40%. I think the tetrad point is very valid here. In I suspect the number of Yellowhammers in Devon has more than halved. At the moment it looks like the range is halved. But I'm sure you're not complacent, but don't be complacent, because when I moved down to Somerset nine years ago, I thought there'll be a lot of birds I'll see here that I never saw in London. I thought I'd see grasshopper walkers, I thought I'd see wind chats, I thought I'd see red stars, willow ticks, you know, um, barn owls, a few barn owls, not, none of the other three, the old one. A bird I really thought I'd saw, because I'd filmed them in Wiltshire a lot, where, which I think is the, the stronghold for them in Britain, it's got a quarter of Britain's corn buttons. We've got a bird here named after the main generic crop that arable farmers grow. It feeds us, it needs to be grown, but we need to have time to eat. And it's a bird that no longer lives, as you said, in Devon, and it's gone from Somerset as well. Now, when politicians tell us that things are okay in the countryside, when self-appointed pressure groups in the countryside with a tenth as many members as the RSPB and a 45th as many members as the National Trust tell us that everything's fine and they are looking after the countryside, and I'm talking mainly about the big landowners here, mention to them that corn buntings are no longer found in Devon and Somerset, because this is ridiculous. This is not a specialist bird. One of the biggest problems is that I'm sure you've heard of this thing called shifting baseline syndrome, whereby what you are brought up with you think is normal. So I was brought up thinking all birds of prey are very rare, except kestrels. And ironically now, I think all birds of prey are very common, except kestrels. Um, we know that this changes, and it has a very dramatic effect, because what it means is you grow up thinking, for example, that wind chats are birds of the upland. That cuckoos are found on Dartmoor, because they're not, you don't see them very much in the other areas. Um, in my case, you think cuckoos are a rare bird, you occasionally hear on the Somerset levels. These birds didn't used to be rare, and they didn't used to be specialists. And, and Mike's point about the spotted flycatcher is, is extremely valuable. This is not a specialist bird, it is a bird that lived on the edges of villages, much as house martins. The BTO statistics show that village is the most important habitat for house martins. But these birds are going. And I have a young friend called Ben McDonald who writes for Birdwatching magazine. 
and he writes incredibly thoughtful pieces about species. And he accepts many of the the received wisdom. But for example, cuckoos, wind traps, spotted flycatchers, all winter in West Africa, and there are issues with habitat loss there, there are issues with the Sahara Desert extending, and that is clearly affecting their populations. But he makes a very valid point. If you go to the Hebrides, it's covered in cuckoos. If you go to uh, Space as I was this year, or <coughs> north of Inverness, spotted flycatchers, pretty much all over the place. And as he says, in southern Britain, and well, we need to wake up to this, it's the food, stupid. You know, the famous line of George Bush, it's the economy, stupid. Here is the food. There is not enough food. And the reason cuckoos are declining, and probably the reason better cuckoos are declining as well, is there's not enough food. The habitat may not be quite as good as we'd like, but there are vast swathes of habitat. And someone said that was a good example. Reed Ward was probably the commonest bird in my village in, in spring. You know, they just seem from every... I mean, not even a clump of reeds. It's like a few brambles, etc. There's a few reeds, and there's a reed ward chuntering away. I've lived there for ten years. I've heard one cricket in the village. And I asked my neighbour, Mick, who's lived there all his life, and he's in his 70s. I said, did you used to get cuckoos here? And he gave me the look that West Country people were a kind people reserved for idiots from London. <laughs> I asked us any question. Cuckoos! Cuckoos! It used to drive us mad. <laughs> then he said something very interesting. He said, I suppose they were down on that reserve on the levels. Because the cycles off and see stuff, it doesn't go quite that far. I said, Mick, they're not. You know, there's. On my patch, I had three or four this year. I was really pleased. And three or four singing cuckoos. So yes, they are there. But this idea that you know a bird like the cuckoo or the winter are rare birds or specialist birds, you know, is simply not true. When I was a kid, like most people, we had <coughs> sparrows around where we lived. I noticed that sparrow again appears to have remained stable in death. I'm impressed. Not entirely sure if you did the population figures, it wouldn't show as plum. Where I live, I have them in, around the farm. We live on an old farm, we have sparrows around. A few years ago, I was making a series called Birds Britannia, and it was about the Britain's, British and cultural love of birds. And we had a sequence about sparrows and their decline. And we got some archive film of sparrows in those big flocks you saw in the 1970s. And it was a bit of a grotty piece of film. Wasn't it? and it was a bit scratched and dusty. And my editor turned to me and said, oh, could we get some more recent film of big flocks of sparrows? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't, because they're gone. And if you had said to us, and I'm not talking, talking to someone in their 90s and saying, you remember before the war, would you ever have imagined? That sounds like a long time ago. The older you get, of course, you realise it's not. But if you say to someone like, you know, most of us here, that a bird that even in the 1970s and probably even the 1980s was fairly common all over the place would have disappeared from huge swathes of both the countryside and particularly in the cities. You know, people thought you were mad. Hedgehogs, not bird. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is ridiculous. And Mark Cocker said to me once, he said, you know, if you said to every parish council in Britain, 50 years ago, just after the war, you have to write down 10 things that are common in your parish. So it might have been <coughs> rural, definitely might have been Latin, uh, snipe, possibly in the parish, you know, hedgehogs, maybe house sparrows in the, in the towns, whatever. And you would have to make sure that nothing you do affects those birds. We'll forget the assets. We'll forget the redneck colour oaks in the north. We won't worry about that. We will focus solely on common do you think we'd be seeing the declines that we've had? Because we would. You know, and we have taken our eye off the ball. And I've, I've grown up from a position where, as Mark also said famously once, he's, um, when I was 12, he's my age, so when I was 12 in the early 70s, he said, I would go out with my binoculars hidden under my animal in case girls. <laughs> the killer lot, which I love. He said, I don't know why I was so worried at that age, and I didn't even know anything. <laughs> now, you know, birding was not something you admitted to, to anyone. Now, it's the new black. You know, Chris Pack, Kate Humble, you know, 
you've got quite cool people doing it. You've got uh, folks on Nature and Next Generation Birders, two fantastic groups of young people who are really, really keen and are really going to shake up conservation in the next 10 years. If you're in your 30s and you're on a conservation job, I'd be really worried because they're going to take your jobs. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So, you know, we, we've, we've seen these incredible changes. Um, I suppose... A question that <clears throat> comes up sometimes is why does it matter? Why does it matter that these things go? Why does it matter that we no longer hear that voice or crickets or sea sparrows? And it is quite hard to answer. I have a lot of time for Tony Juniper, who's done a fantastic job in making people understand that the habitats can have a massive economic benefit, things like flood prevention things like carbon storage. But it is quite technical, and as Tony himself would admit, you cannot put a price on a skylark or a song thrush. They have no value, or, I would argue, they have infinite value. And just as when someone tries to sell, I always think this is funny, they try to sell, say, a Titian or a Raphael from a British gallery, and everyone gets very upset, and they raise money to keep it in England, keep it here. It's Italian. Why, why are you trying to keep here? What's that? You know, I love them all, but what's that got to do with our heritage? Whereas skylarks and song thrushes, if we lose them, it is like destroying a piece of art. It is, it is as philistine as that. Um, over the last few years, I think as I got older and started writing about birds, particularly when I moved to Somerset, I wrote a book about my parish. And it forced me to look at common wildlife because there's nothing rare in my parish because it's an ordinary country parish in Somerset. And I spent a year really, really looking at things. And I had a wonderful moment where sometime in February, the song thrush outside my bedroom window turned itself on. And it's like this. It's like a light coming, isn't it? You suddenly hear... And I remembered a story but well, I remember two things. The first thing I remember was when I was a child walking into school, which we did when we were eight, um, about six, um, I would walk to school in the London suburbs and I would come back and I would hear and see song thrushes sitting on the roof. And 30 years later, I moved back, around the age of 40, I moved back to a nearby suburb with beautiful trees and nice gardens. No song thrushes. They'd all gone. And it was only when I moved down to Somerset, where, thank God, we still have them, I heard them. But I was reminded of a story that my grandmother used to tell. Now, I'm going to tell it because it's a Devon story. My great grandfather <coughs> was called Edgar Snow, and he owned the country house pub on the, what we it was the country house, it was the lane between Exeter and what is now the motorway. It's now quite a busy road. It's now sadly been knocked down. Um, but he also owned a market garden. Uh, Ludwell, Ludwell Country. It's now the middle of Ludwell Country Park. And I co own, with various cousins and aunts, a quarter of them. So I block the whole park, a quarter of one lovely field, which is being managed for a while, which is very nice. But Edgar came home one day and he said to my nan, who must have been, this was, it would have been about 1914, but 100 years ago. He said to her, There's this bird and it keeps talking to me. And it says, Snowy, Snowy, pay the rent, pay the rent. <laughs> My nan died back in the 1990s, and I'd forgotten this story. And when I heard them back in Somerset, I remembered the story, and I realised, of course, what I hadn't realised when I was a child when she told me the story, it was a song thrush. Now, for me, that very personal link with the bird that I hear now, you can't put a price on that. You can't put a value on why that bird matters. Because as I say, it's either valueless or invaluable. I've got that right. Invaluable is a funny word, isn't it? But anyway, it, it's, it's worth everything to me. And we all feel that, don't we? We all feel that about certain birds. Mike was talking about you know, the lapwings that we used to see. And just, now, you feel a sense of personal <laughs> loss. And it is as if, it's like when you remember an old friend who's passed, or, a, or a, an older relative. And you have very fond memories of them, but you know they're not coming back. But with birds, we do have a chance to bring them back. We could do it. But 
it will take a hell of a lot to do. I've just finished a book, it's taken me five years to write, and I've finally finished it, and we've finally got a title. It's going to be called Wild Kingdom, Bringing Back Britain's Wildlife. And I go through various habitats one by one, and I basically start with the three most important habitats in Britain, which are also the most degraded and the most concerning. Farmland, woodland, upland. And those three are in real trouble. And between them, they cover about 90 to 95% of Britain. Farmland in some areas, they overlap farm, upland farms. But those three habitats are what we've got to get right. Ironically, what we have got right are the later chapters. So I cover urban Britain. You know, urban wildlife is doing very well, despite this government obsession with building on brownfield sites, which actually destroys some really fantastic invertebrate sites. <laughs> Um, what I call the accidental countryside, um, which Richard may be called the unofficial countryside back in the 70s in a very far-sighted book, which is the messy bits, the edges, the edge lands, the railway lines, the canal banks, the rivers, you know, not necessarily urban habitats. A lot of them are, of course, roadside verges are not necessarily or not usually urban habitats. They go through the countryside, but they provide a corridor and they do this. Then, you know, birds in those places, are do, and flowers particularly, are doing pretty well. Insects are doing pretty well in those places, because, of course, they're not sprayed pesticides and insecticides. Um, and the final chapter is about a place obviously very dear to my heart, the wetlands, mainly of the sunset levels, which I know. And, as I said, I moved down almost a decade ago, and I have seen the most extraordinary change. The year I moved, the very first bittern spread there, we now have more bitterns than the whole of Norfolk and Suffolk put together. We <coughs> were really proud of them. <laughs> um, we think they survived the two hard winters, by the way, by eating starlings. <laughs> there was a theory, I don't know if Roger will back that up, but there was a theory that, because they didn't, they didn't drop at all. Between, you know, those two really hard winters, and normal bitterns get really hit by them. They also fly around a lot, so when I <laughs> talk about shifting baseline syndrome, I took George, who's now 10, I took him out when he was five, and we did a two-hour walk, and we saw seven bitterns. And when the seventh one flew over our heads and circled, I went, ah, George, a bittern! And he went, yeah. <laughs> because for him, he drinks bitterns. He has never seen a hedgehog. The survey the other day about my said that 38% of children in Britain have never seen a hedgehog. I would have thought it was 95%. You know, he's seen monk jack and beavers and... Pine Martins and, you know, great ID, but he's never seen a hedgehog. That, that's tells me something. Um, so we are doing stuff, and we are also putting things back. We are putting things back. Now, a lot of purists argue, and I respect their view, but I don't agree with it anymore, that we shouldn't be interfering with nature. I think we need to interfere as much as possible. Where I part company with George Bombay, who again I respect usually, but George tends to say, let's just leave the land and see what happens. Well, what will happen is all your grassland and butterflies will disappear because it will be scrub. You know? And I think George's view, if you waited 5,000 years and didn't and got rid of about 60 million people, it will be great. You know, it will work really well. I mean, I'm being a little because actually he does some fantastic work and he has some very good arguments. But, you know, I believe that we should intervene, and the, 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 the RSPB and Wildlife Trust in some sense, Natural England, on the Avalon marshes, have done this. They have, you know, and I took a group of people the other day on my writing course, and they said it's so fantastic to see this ancient primeval landscape. I said it's 20 years old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a post-industrial landscape. I remember it all fields around it, but I don't. But totally right. You know, and, and it is the most extraordinary achievement, and we should be shouting about it. We're very I don't know what the Devon's are. People in Somerset are very modest, and they don't shout about it. We don't say, look, we've got one of the best places for wildlife in Britain now, please come and see it. So there were no <coughs> bitterns, there were no great white eagles when I moved. Ravens, I didn't see a raven for the first year, apart from the men dips, and now they fly in my garden every day. You know. So there is a lot of positivity, but there's so much we're missing. I've noticed, of course, your lovely logo, the Montague's Harrier. George Montague is a huge... Um, hero of mine, because he, he had a midlife crisis in his late 30s and ran off with his mistress to Devon and wrote books about birds. <laughs> and I had a midlife crisis in my late 30s and ran off with my now wife to Somerset and wrote books about birds. So I, I, I feel like I haven't gotten on a rusty nail and died of tetanus. <laughs> he did, sadly. But George Montague 
one of the great heroes, and you should, you should be picking this man up. You know, a Wiltshire man by birth, but a Devon man for most of his life. And he, you know, he dragged ornithology, kicking and screaming from a sort of superstitious view, which still prevailed in the, after he died in Victoria. <laughs> but he, he got real data. He did what you have done with his atlas. He created this fantastic um, ornithological dictionary basically sorted out things like Montague's Harriers, there are not an, a grey one and a brown one that are different species there are two grey ones and two brown ones and they're different species and they're males and females <laughs> you follow that, we head of Montague's Harriers you know. so he, he, he used observation and he did it he would have been astonished to have seen what's arrived but also what's gone I'm sure in the 200 years he died 20 years ago this year <coughs> um, I want to end with the story of another um, great man, a man called Derek Moore, who some of you will know. Derek Moore was a dear friend of mine, and he ran the Suffolk Wildlife Trust, and then he went to Wales and ran the trust there. And Derek was, as he would put it, quite a cantankerous man. And the phrase didn't suffer fools gladly could have been, been invented for Derek. He, he made quite a lot of enemies, but he made a lot of friends, and his big way of making friends was to go to farms and say, OK, how can I help you? I know you're interested. Most farmers, all farmers I've ever met, took you around where I live, they're really keen to do something for wildlife, but they are forced by these stupid policies from successive governments in Europe not to. You know, there, there, are will and there are some good sides to, obviously, what has been done in terms of the subsidies. But by and large, most of our subsidies don't go towards conservation. And most of our farmers, apart from a handful of these, are not very well off. So no one's winning. You know, it, it, it's a ridiculous situation, and we absolutely need to change that. And Derek spent a lot of time doing that. And what Derek did, which I, I tend not to do, he tended to get a bit angry, and he tended to piss people off a bit. But then he would offer them the solution, and he would work tirelessly with them. And when I went to his memorial service in Suffolk, many farmers came, and stood, one of them, the son of one of them, stood up and said, Derek told me all I knew about farming and conservation, and they now run this fantastic farm to run the RFP for the award. And it was a very touching moment because conservationists for too long have basically ignored a lot of the people who actually <coughs> do the hard work on the land and have not necessarily. And I know in the southwest you've been really good at it. I know people here work really closely with the farming community <coughs> and the landowning community and have made a real difference. But as Mike said, if the future for Devon birds looks bleak, we have got to do something about this. And we've got to work together with Somerset, as I know the Wildlife <coughs> Trust are. Gloucestershire, Wiltshire, Cornwall, you know, places where it's the similar factors that are affecting it. And I think if we can do that, we can make things work. When I, um, finally, when I left the BBC, I was in the canteen one day, and a colleague of mine, a, 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 a secretary, had seen a bullfinch in her garden. And she wasn't a birder, but she was very excited. She came to describe it to me, it was definitely a bullfinch, and I was really excited for her. And she was saying how the children had seen it and they loved it. And a colleague of mine, Tim Schoons, who now runs Springwatch, he said to me, he said, you look like one of those American evangelical preachers. He said, I, I expected you to put your hands on my shoulders and say, have you heard the good news about wildlife? And I said, you know what, Tim, I'm leaving the BBC next week and you've just told me what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'm going to go out there and evangelise the wildlife. I know a lot of you do this already, but we are a reticent bunch, the English. We're not the English, but you know, we're not very good at trying to convert <coughs> people. We think it's a big naff. We have to convert our neighbours, our friends, our local <coughs> politicians, our national politicians. And in some cases, you know, George Osborne, it will involve standing there and shaking them to find me understand it. But we have got to do this. Because there is a movement going on where I think people feel enough is enough. I think people are fed up with the way that the countryside in particular has been hijacked by a very small group of people who have very vested interest in keeping things the way they are. And I think everyone's fed up about the fact that people in the countryside, ordinary people in the countryside, are not particularly benefiting economically. And what we know is if we can make a better future for Devon's birds and Devon's wildlife, it can be a better future for people and places as well. And the fundamental message I would say to people always is forget biodiversity, forget you know, these terms, these habitat, these terms that put people off. 
When you're talking to people who may not be yet one of us, <laughs> say to them, people, places, and wildlife. Because that's what this is all about. Dartmoor, the sunset levels, anyway. It's all about creating something that is good for wildlife, which benefits people. And if we can do that, then hopefully the future is in Thank you.